Welcome back. In part 1, we reversed engineer most of this HP switching power supply. There were of course the predictable comments that I should just A, replace all the caps and B, swap it for a new supply. While there are many valid ways to skin this cat, I'm not going to do either of those two. The first one, which is just speculative part swapping, would only repair the supply by just pure stroke of luck. Now you might have lucked out once or twice, or might not have the equipment or knowledge to do any better, but you should still try. Debugs based on speculation won't get you very far. On the other hand, if you are capable of understanding what is happening, you will be able to repair every circuit every time and won't be tossing away perfectly good components. The second one, uh, replacing with a supply, is a, is a more valid thing and something I do sometimes in, in more generic situations. But in this case, it's next to impossible with this assortment of eight uncommon voltages, some positive, some negative, some for digital, some with double staging and filtering for analog, some high voltage, and even two of them being variable with unknown variability function, uh, let alone the unknown amperage. So if you are a recapper or a power supply swapper, look away. We are going to do it the Curious Mark way, find out what has failed, blow a few more things while doing it, but replace only what's failed and hopefully learn something in the process. So, so far we know that the supply blows its MOSFETs, so it's not safe to put them back until we check that the control circuitry is working properly. Which brings us to the control circuitry, which we need to check first. Uh, there should be something that produces pulses for all of our MOSFETs. Uh, on the buck converter we should have PWM pulses at 80 kHz and on the DC to DC converter we should have square wave at 40 kHz. And my worry is that one of these is stuck and blows the MOSFETs. Now the catch-22 here is that in order for this circuit to be powered, the supply needs to work. So the way it's done usually there's always a starter circuit uh, and on, on most it's pretty simple. It's just the, take some of your 300 volts here and you put a big resistor and you put a zener and a capacitor and off you go. The circuits don't consume much current, you can power them off this simple circuit and this gets really hot by the way. So actually a very common failure in uh, power supplies that don't start is that uh, the cap is zapped or the resistor has burned. But in this one they made it even more complicated and it's actually a three-stage process. So the first one is the simple power resistors through Zener which goes through the kickstart pulser and generates a 15 volt pulse every two seconds. So the kickstarter is this circuit, which has the simple resistor, uh, it's those two resistors, and the zener, which is right here. Which then goes through one more MOSFET, which draws current through a thermistor and gets 12 volt for 200 milliseconds. That's the kick start power. This transistor, which will take the current through a thermistor, which then, if it gets 12 volts and the 300 volts, the control circuit will release the pulses. And I should check that I have controlled pulses. So right now my power circuits are not there. There's no MOSFET. So I will not get the 12 volt takeover power that will complete the chain and get it started. But at least I can check that I go all the way through 80 kilohertz here. You could actually see this in action in the failed instrument. See how the LEDs blink shortly every two seconds? I was puzzled by this behavior, but now I understand it. It was this kick starter chain trying to get the supply starting and obviously having no luck at it. And unfortunately, I cannot just give 12 volt to this thing uh, because unless it has the 300 volts, uh, it will go into under voltage mode and uh, stop the generation of the control pulses. So I have to go through the whole chain to check it works. 
So in order to do that, uh, I'll use my differential probe. Uh, you know, when you work on switchers, you have to isolate your oscilloscope and this one takes up to 500 volts of common mode and then you have no problems. So I am here on the voltmeter. I have the output of the rectifier that should go up to 325 volts. And here I am on the gate of the kickstart MOSFET and see if that works. And also here I have the VARIAC, um, not that it does much on the switcher, but if, if it consumes too much current, I'll feel it before it turns on. And since I don't have MOSFETs, nothing bad should happen. Oh, I have 200 and... Oh, okay, so that works. Here we go. I am seeing 296 volts rectified. And I see huh, a bunch of pulses. That's not what I expected. Maybe that's what it's supposed to do. That are a Kickstarter pulse, but I would have suspected just one big pulse, not, not chopped like this. Now something interesting happened when I turned on the VARIAC. At some point, When it's 200 volt rectify, I get this clean pulse, which is what I expected I would get. I don't know if it means anything. So I was confused by the measurement I got, and I think it's a measurement error because I brought the old girl in, which has a slower differential probe, but also can take a lot more uh, differential voltage. There you go, we have a, a nice clean pulse and so everything looks like it works like it should, it's also the required 12 volts and that thing is just giving me this weird pulses, so I think it's something rotten with my uh, eBay source probe or the way I use it. So that's another classic, chasing artifacts caused only by your measurement technique or instruments. Who hasn't spent hours trying to diagnose a bad measurement? But while I was fighting with my uncooperative HP probe, something else failed and the kickstart power disappeared entirely. So this is getting more and more frustrating. I was going to show you how the uh, control signal started correctly uh, on both of the stages and then I couldn't get anything anymore. Uh, then I checked what power was happening at the circuit, uh, it was not the 12 volt pulse anymore. So I said, darn, I must have fried the uh, MOSFET. So I took it off uh, because we checked the pulse is fine. So MOSFET checks out good and I broke the pin while I was doing that, of course. And then I tried to part it directly. No, the hell was it? The MOSFET's not there. So I'm just, uh, just went with the power supply and part it up and uh, got it to 7 volts and 300 milliamps, which is 2.1 watts. So I, if I have a short somewhere, it will show up. And you no, know, you can, I can tell which circuit that powered, I reverse engineered that, and you can tell it's this guy over here. It's a driver for the second stage that gets hot. So this little fellow is getting hot. So the component that just shorted is the MOSFET driver. It's a little IC that amplifies the uh, TTL level 5 volt pulses to the level that uh, are necessary to drive the MOSFETs. And uh, it's the one that drives the, the DC to DC converter MOSFETs. There's another chip and that drives the buck converter. So that one failed and it failed sh shorting. That's really weird. So I bet you that one was uh, pretty sick beforehand and finally give up the ghost. Okay, so my dead, what well, I suppose dead circuit is out. Still haven't put the MOSFET back in, but at least make sure there is no short. It seems it's okay now. So fortunately, as soon as I removed the driver IC, the short was gone. I put my kickstart MOSFET back in and which should be able to power up the control circuits again, or so we hope. Okay, let's see if we can climb out of our damage curve. 
So now I am checking if the drive of the box stage is working and actually it should only turn on when this is approximately at 300 volts right here and you can kind of vaguely see it over here but I still have this weird measurement that on this guy over there you can see the oscillation so you can see it's starting to oscillate here and if I take a fast trace of it let's try and do that it's going it's such a slow scope for digital acquisition but you can see it's painfully building the waveform and it's, it's oscillating fine let's stop it right here and then you can see and it's actually the 80 kilohertz and it's at fairly high duty cycle so it's trying to start so this stage is working fine shouldn't burn the MOSFET All right, my replacement chips have arrived, uh, which give me a, a day to think about things. And I actually think that might be what had caused the problem in the first place. If the driver I see were failing, it could explain why one of the MOSFETs he was driving died. And that would explain why the second one died. It also could explain why it wouldn't start if it was in a, in a halfway state. So maybe we have found the part that uh, was you know, in the process of failing and eventually failed fail completely. Another thing I did while I was waiting for the circuits is uh, take care of my HP probe and tune everything about it. At least it is full of little things that you have to tune. And I've come to the conclusion that the, the probe is working perfectly fine, but I don't have the right attachment here. I have the 10x probe and I need the 100x at the voltage I am uh, working at. So what I ended up doing is using the current probe from the Tektronix. And it turns out this scope being old fashioned as an output for the uh, Z deflection or what is it? Y deflection, sorry, the signal output, which is basically the output of the current probe. And I have this big cable out here it comes and what I do it comes out here and I digitize it on the modern scope so I have I can it allows me to use this plugin with this scope and kind of get the best of both worlds and now I am hooked up to the driver of the MOSFET uh, so this is the, the buck MOSFET and you can tell it's doing the right thing it's reported correctly by the tech probe and improperly by the HP probe. And so you see the, the tech and the HP. And as I start to go, we see the pulse and we see the, the pulse lengthening, uh, but I can do, I can do even better. I can go into acquisition mode, go into segmented memory and do segmented acquisition. And here we go. Basically, I've taken a little snapshot of the whole thing. Okay, let's play it. And you can see the pulse starting small and lengthening during the start pulse. This is something that you can only do with, with, with a modern digital scope. Let's do it again. That's a high speed and you see the, it's trying to lengthen the pulse because of course it sees no output. The control electronics is working very well. Uh, so it's about time we put, I think we can put the MOSFETs back. Uh, there is no issue with the control security. Okay, so we will put our little IC back, which I believe is the original source of all our, of our problems, I hope. We'll see pretty soon and I'll solder that in and then I'll solder all the MOSFETs back. So let's stop here for this episode. The Tally is a wacky HP differential probe saved by a good tech probe, a driver IC that gave up the ghost, but a whole startup chain that checks out OK. The Kickstarter pulse is generated, the control circuitry detects the 300 volt from the rectifier and starts driving the switching stages. 
Moreover, we see it reacting to seeing no power and trying to lengthen the PWM pulse, so the controller is probably working just fine. The likely cause of our trouble and kill MOSFETs is now the very dead driver IC, which I have ordered and received. We'll see if we have fixed it in the next episode. Spoiler alert, it does not quite go according to plan.